Hey there, this is Dr. Justin Marcajani, and today's talk is going to be on fish oil and omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So we're going to dive in deep about omega-3 and omega-6. We're going to talk about cod liver oil. We're going to compare and contrast it to fish oil. We're going to talk about excessive omega-6 to omega-3, and we're going to talk about flaxseed and being vegetarian and how that affects our omega-3 fatty acid levels. So let's dive in here. We're talking about omega-3 and omega-6 starting off. So what makes an omega-3 and omega-3 and what makes an omega-6 and omega-6? So let's just start out here. We have the first omega-3. These are called our parents' essential fatty acids. Everything emanates from them here. So you can see this is the starting point of the domino cascade and this is the domino cascade of the omega-6. So we have ALA, alpha-linolenic acid. I'm gonna abbreviate that ALA, the same fat that's in flaxseed oil. And we have linoleic acid, similar, but again, this is an omega-6 fatty acid. This is an omega-3. So with ALA, or our flax, for instance, what makes an omega-3 an omega-3 is where the placement of that last double bond is. If it's three carbons away from the end of the chain, three, that makes it an omega-3. If it's six carbons away, that double bond is six away from the end, that makes it an omega-6. And again, omega-3 inherently tend to be anti-inflammatory. It, it quells or decreases inflammation by feeding various prostaglandin pathways, which we'll go over in a second. And omega-6 tend to be pro-inflammatory because they feed certain prostaglandin pathways that drive inflammation like prostaglandin 2, if you will. And these basically are eicosanoids, right? Pro prostaglandins are eicosanoids. They almost have like hormone-like effects in the body. And if we're driving eicosanoids by eating omega-6 fats that are pro-inflammatory like prostaglandin 2, the equivalent is this. Imagine going into a room. Let's say you smoke cigarettes. Let's say someone left the gas burner on and the whole room is full of um, gasoline or gas fumes. Let's say you couldn't smell. Let's say you had a sinus congestion. Well, if you lit that cigarette, the room would explode. Now the same thing with people that have excessive omega-6 fatty acids and lots of prostaglandin too, something happens stress-wise, maybe bad posture, maybe an injury, maybe just stress and bad sleep, it sets off this inflammatory cascade where essentially all chronic and degenerative conditions, if you look at a map where you look at omega-6 fatty acids and chronic degenerative disease, there's a strong correlation with omega-6 polyunsaturated fats being higher with disease on the y-axis. So the more chronic disease we see, it correlates with more omega-6 fatty acids. So that's a correlation, but there is a causative mechanism being inflammation. Inflammation drives chronic disease because the person that's inflamed is gonna break down faster. When we break down, disease and pathology are inevitable, okay? So when we have omega-3 fatty acids, we're feeding various prostaglandin pathways that are anti-inflammatory. Again, we have our cell membranes, and the more healthy fats that we eat, we encompass that cell membrane, we make healthy cell membranes, and we drive inflammation downward. So you can see here with our omega-3 cascade, we have like our flax oil here, for instance. We have our EPA and our DHA fish oil, and these essentially drive prostaglandin E3, which is an anti-inflammatory cascade pathway. With the omega-6, that this is again pro-inflammatory, this is our linoleic acid. It drives dihomo gamma linoleic acid, which this could potentially be, this could potentially be anti-inflammatory. So dihomo gamma linoleic acid will be the fats like evening primrose oil, borage oil, black currant seed oil. Again, these fats can be very helpful for females that are having menopausal issues, excuse me, female hormone issues primarily, and or skin or acne issues. Taking these fats can be very helpful and they drive the prostaglandin one pathways. This is another anti-inflammatory. It reduces inflammation. But you can see here, arachidonic acid is this inflammatory uh, fat that can drive inflammation. And it's not that arachidonic acid is bad by itself. We need arachidonic acid. It's very, very important to our health. We get arachidonic acid in lots of healthy quality meats as well. It's more of the ratio. So typically, we've had this one-to-one -one ratio or one-to-four ratio. One-to-one -one ratio, meaning we're having typically omega-3 to omega-6, we're having at least one-to-one, -one, or we're having essentially a one-to-four. 
where at the most we're having four times omega-6 to one time omega-3. And this is important. This is how we've evolved as a species in regarding the food that we're feeding our body. And now we're seeing it skewing way up. Now we're seeing it almost up to one to 50. So we're getting 50 times more omega-6 than omega-3. So basically what we're doing is we're setting the stage where we're putting on the, the gas in the room. No one knows it. Someone comes in the room and they light the cigarette, boom, everything blows up. So it's just like that here. We're setting the tables up for excessive inflammation. And now arachidonic acid is important. So it's not about avoiding it because that would be like saying, well, you know, avoid meat, avoid all these other healthy foods. It's avoid foods that are going to drive the ratio up here. And the foods that are going to drive that ratio up very high are going to be our refined vegetable oils. These are going to be the cottonseed oil, the soybean oil, the safflower oil. These are going to be excess canola. These are going to be potentially even excess nuts. All right? These can drive this ratio up super high. And again, the reason why that's happened is that the processed food industry has relied on lots of these cheap omega-6 fatty acids to be in all of our junk food. So people are getting it because of all of the junk food that we're eating. Also, again, if we're not eating animals with natural feed, right, grass-fed um, steaks and grass-fed meat are going to have more omega-3s, relatively speaking, than their grain-fed variety. So what the animal eats is really important for the essential fatty acid profile of that animal. So in other words, we want to be eating healthy animals that are fed biologically appropriate, right? Cows eat grass, not grain. And then also we want to make sure we're eating foods that are high in fatty fish. If you look at a cascade chart of omega-3s to omega-6s, your highest omega-3s are going to be in your fatty fish, in your shrimp, in your cod, in your salmon. So those are going to be really important things you want to eat because they're just so high in omega-3s and virtually no omega-6 in it. So consuming high amounts of fish oil is going to be vital to keeping this ratio intact to keeping a higher ratio or a one-to-one -one ratio, if you will. And a lot of vegetarians, for instance, think, okay, well, let's just consume flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil is a, again, is ALA, right? That's a omega-3 fatty acid. Well, the only problem is this, is that we need this delta-60 saturase enzyme to convert ALA into EPA. So this is fish oil right here. EPA is a 20-carbon fatty acid called Ecosa pentanoic acid, it's 20 carbons. And we have to basically use this enzyme, and this enzyme adds two carbons to the ALA and makes it a 20 carbon EPA. When we eat fish oil, we're driving up EPA. When we eat flax, we're driving up ALA. And we're basically kind of crossing our fingers and praying that ALA gets converted downstream. The only problem is in healthy individuals, only 20% will convert downstream only 20%. So if you're going to be a vegetarian, which again, for most people, I feel like you're missing out on certain nutrients that are essential that you can't get from animals. But if you are going to be one, you should be consuming a DHA fat primarily from algae. So then you're not, so then you bypass this whole conversion. So if you do an algae, you're at least going to be helping with the DHA fatty acid by supporting that. And just so you know, Algae is what fish eat that helps bioaccumulate a lot of these EPA and DHA fats. So really important there, if you're going to be vegetarian, don't make the assumption that flax is going to be enough because in healthy people, 20% is what's converted. And this is the really important part. If you're inflamed, if you have high amount of insulin resistance or high amount of inflammation, this conversion right here is going to be blocked almost altogether. So if you're unhealthy coming into it and you're saying, well, I'm going to just use a whole bunch of flaxseed oil, definitely don't recommend that because you're not going to be able to make this conversion happen. You want to use high quality fish oil. That's going to be your best bet. So looking down here, there's a lot of hype over cod liver oil today too. I love cod liver oil, but if you look at the amount of EPA in cod liver oil, you're going to find about three to four times in fish oil, three to four times more in fish oil. Now there's not a problem with that. If we're treating a patient and we're trying to use uh, omega-3s therapeutically to reduce inflammation, I'm gonna use fish oil because it's much higher, much less pills, much lower dosage to take for the patient. 
we're trying to reduce inflammation, we're going to be driving up the EPA fatty acid to really reduce inflammation. But again, cod liver oil has other benefits. It's also very high in vitamin A, which can be very helpful for your thyroid. And if you're getting the fermented variety, there's also some vitamin K and other nutrients in there that's also very beneficial. So again, we want to look a little bit deeper at this. Cod liver oil is going to be great, but if we're trying to drive a reduction of inflammation, fish oil may be a better alternative. But I'm not saying don't take cod liver oil, just know the reason why you're taking it in the first place. With my athletes or my inflamed patients, we'll use a triglyceride form of fish oil so it's better absorbed and we'll use levels up to four, six, eight grams um, per day to really reduce inflammation. Now I'm going to do a part two of this video where we really delve into dosage and we kind of go into the DHA fat as well as the COX enzymes and what we've done in the past to reduce inflammation. So stay tuned for part two very soon. Thanks. This is Dr. Justin here. Click on screen to get a hold of me quick. So if you have issues with inflammation, we can help get to the root cause. And also sign up for my thyroid and or female hormone series. Again, great more great information coming your way. Subscribe to get more videos at your fingertips. This is Dr. J signing off. Take care.